So today we're going to be talking about passwordless vulnerabilities. Uh, and I titled this way, probably I should have changed it to passkeys, but we're going to talk about it during this talk. But who am I? Well, my name is Aldo. I've been doing AppSec for more than 15 years now. Uh, I am also still the chapter leader for my city. And I'm saying still because it's probably going to be deactivated pretty soon uh, due to lack of activity. But uh, in the meantime, I'm still the chapter leader for my city. Uh, and also, I am the application security lead for Hyper, which is a passwordless startup. And today, I'm here, about, I'm here to talk about passwordless vulnerabilities. So it, it's going to make sense, trust me. So before we begin, uh, can anybody here raise your hand if you think that using passwordless is actually worse than using passwords? Anybody? No? Nobody? Just a few? All right, cool. Uh, well, the answer to this question is uh, no. Uh, it's not actually worse. And actually, this is my entire presentation. Uh, this is not worse. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, well, no, that was a, a terrible joke, sorry. Uh, this is what we're actually going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick introduction in the topic uh, where, where uh, I'm going to be talking about why am I giving this talk today. What is passwordless for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with this word, with this paradigm? And then we're going to dive into the actual vulnerabilities that we have encountered with uh, passwordless implementations. And at the end, I'm going to give you some recommendations, uh, general recommendations about the topic. So uh, what is this talk about? So it's going to be a brief introduction into passwordless. Uh, this is not a full talk on passwordless. Uh, I may be covering some details, but I'm not going to be very, very technical. Uh, this is about vulnerabilities in a passwordless implementation. And this is completely oriented to web applications. You can implement passwordless in other type of applications, but this is specific to web applications. And uh, these vulnerabilities were identified in a commercial product, uh, which it was actually uh, our own product. What this talk is not about, uh, we're not going to be disclosing any new attacks today. Uh, I'm not going to be dropping any ODAs today. I'm, I'm sorry, but that's not happening today. Uh, also, this is not a full talk on passwordless. And we're not going to be talking about breaking cryptography. Uh, as we're going to see, uh, one of the most common implementations of passwordless is using public key cryptography. But we're not going to be talking about that today. Uh, one more thing. This is completely about server-side issues. Uh, and I do mention this because. Uh, in a previous iteration of this talk, there were some misconceptions. So this is completely about server size issues. Uh, this talk is not about vulnerabilities in the passwordless standard, which is uh, called FIDO. And this is not also about web authent. Uh, it is about applications that are using web authent, but it's not about vulnerabilities in web authent uh, per se. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to talk to you about why am I presenting this. So why? Why are we doing this today? Well, I think that nobody's actually talking about vulnerabilities in passwordless implementations. Uh, from what I can, uh, was able to find, uh, I didn't see anybody talking about this. Uh, nobody really. Uh, and also, a major adoption of passkeys is happening right now. A lot of companies are going passwordless, are using passkeys nowadays. And uh, nobody's talking about the dangers of using passwordless. I actually went to a boldb.com. I searched for passwordless. I didn't, find, I didn't find a single thing. Out of curiosity, I went to our competitors' websites to see if they had anything published, any public advisories, anything at all. And they didn't have anything. So yeah, nobody's doing this. So this is the main reason why we're talking about passwordless issues today. A uh, couple months ago, this is what it looked like. Uh, several companies were implementing passwordless, rather passkeys, which is an implementation of passwordless. Uh, you know, companies like OnePassword, TikTok, GitHub, a lot of companies were doing this. Even financial companies such as PayPal with, uh, were doing this. And just last week, uh, when I was updating these slides, uh, I saw more companies doing this, of course. Amazon is doing it, WhatsApp is doing it, uh, Google is now using this as the default method, and even Microsoft is providing more support for passkeys. But what is passwordless? Uh, essentially, passwordless means uh, using no passwords. That's, it's as simple as that, essentially. Uh, you can log into a website without using any passwords at all. And usually, one of the most common implementations is using public key cryptography. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, essentially, you have two keys, one private key and one public key. Uh, the server usually, well, most of the times, uh, has the 
the public key, sends a challenge, and the client signs that challenge using the private key. And that is how the client is authenticated. Uh, this is a very secure method. Uh, this is widely used. So, uh, so far it hasn't been broken yet. And this is how the most common implementations of passwords work. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention is that using a password manager is not equal to passwordless. And I do mention this because I saw an article saying, somebody was saying, hey, go passwordless. You can use your or password manager. And of course, that is not passwordless. You're simply storing your, your passwords somewhere else. Also, using two-factor authentication is not passwordless. Uh, you just add, you are adding another factor to your, to your password, so that is not passwordless. And of course, using a one-time password is not passwordless either. Uh, these are a few examples of how you can implement passwordless. Uh, we're going to talk about them real quick. The first one is Magic Links. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with Magic Links, essentially an application generates a link that usually contains like a token or a hash or some sort of identification. And when a user clicks on that link, they are automatically authenticated to a website. And that is why it's called a magic link. Uh, the second preferred method, uh, well, well my, the second method, which is my preferred one, is using security keys. Uh, is anybody here already using YubiKeys or something similar? Perfect. And for those of you who raise your hand, are you using, uh, could you keep your hand up if you're using security keys without passwords? All right, one. Okay, so that, all right, so you are using security keys as a second factor. Uh, security keys could be used as a passwordless authentication and it's just as secure. And, uh, but obviously security keys have their own challenges. Uh, they cannot scale, of course. Uh, imagine if you have a company of uh, 10,000 or 50,000 people and you wanna deploy uh, Juby keys for everyone, that is gonna be very expensive and then you are gonna have to deliver those keys to your users and you're gonna have to onboard those 50,000 users and then you have to manage 50,000 security keys. So that, uh, even though it's very secure, is usually uh, not for every company. And lastly, we have biometrics. Biometrics work exactly the same way as security keys. Uh, they have, you can use uh, biometrics to unlock a private key and use that key to authenticate yourself. So it's very similar and it's very convenient. And nowadays, everybody has a smartphone that you can use biometrics to uh, authenticate with. So uh, that is very convenient and easy to deploy. Uh, this is an example of uh, an application implementing passwordless login using a, an email. Essentially, what Slack does is they send you an email and that includes a code. And once you type in that code, you are authenticated and you don't have to use a password. So that is very convenient. But of course, if, you, if an attacker has access to your email, of course, they are going to have access to your authentication. So, uh, so far we had several options to implement uh, passwordless and there was no standard. And this is where the FIDO Alliance comes in. So essentially the FIDO Alliance is an organization behind the FIDO2 standard. Uh, basically this is an a specification is an authentication standard that tells you how to implement passwordless correctly. It has two main components. One of them is the web uh, specification and the second one is the client to authentication protocol. For this talk, we're gonna kinda ignore the second part and we're gonna focus on the web authent portion. Essentially web authent, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a set of APIs, JavaScript APIs, that allow your browser to talk with these authenticators. And authenticators can be anything such as security keys to your fingerprint, to anything that the operating system provides. So WebAuthn, again, is just an API that allows you to talk between the authenticators and your web application. And uh, passkeys, because everybody's talking about passkeys. Passkeys are essentially a FIDO2 authenticator. Uh, there are some differences, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, we're gonna treat them as uh, equals or equivalent. So when I say passwordless, when I say passkeys, when I say uh, security keys or biometrics, I am talking about the same because uh, at the end of the day, they are very similar and they help you authenticate using web buttons. And just to double down on web button, because this one is really important for a talk, uh, again, it's, it is an API that allows uh, your browser to communicate with your relying party or web application. Uh, in the FIDO standard, it's called Reliant Party, but it's essentially a web application. So you use this API to interact with your authenticators, and in that way, you can register and authenticate using uh, these authenticators. Uh, again, authenticators can be anything like a security key, a Touch ID on your Mac, uh, Windows Hello, uh, Face ID, Touch ID, and essentially anything that your operating system provides. 
And these are just a few examples of what using web opt-in looks like. Uh, the first one is when you're trying to log into Microsoft using a security key, and the other options are for Mac OS and iOS when you're using Touch ID. So if you have seen any of these uh, screens before, it is very likely that you have used web button before, even if you don't know it. So why? Why using passwordless? Uh, as many of you know, uh, everything about passwords suck. Everything, you know, uh, storing them, protecting them, uh, you have to hash them, you have to add a salt, you have to make sure that nobody has access to them, uh, you have to make sure that even if they are leaked, nobody can, you know, uh, crack them. It is, it is a problem. And when you go passwordless, you don't have to worry about any of those things. Uh, you don't have to worry about ineffective complexity fax, uh, factors. Uh, and one, one thing that I learned is that people often don't know their own passwords. Uh, you know, a few months ago when I got my wife a new phone, uh, we were setting up her phone, and uh, I asked her to log into her account, and he, she didn't know her own password. And uh, then uh, the same thing happened with my parents. I got them new phones, I asked them to log into their account, and then they didn't know their own passwords. So uh, a lot of people don't even know their passwords. So that, that is also a problem. Uh, when you go passwordless, this is faster than traditional MFA because when you are using MFA, you type in your username, your password, and then you add the additional factor. And when you're using passwordless, uh, well, you don't need the password, so it's faster. One more thing about passwordless, and especially about FIDO2, is that when you are using it, uh, it becomes phishing resistant. What that means is that you register your authenticator with a specific website. Uh, that means that even if somebody sends you a fake link and tries to fish your credentials, it's not gonna work. Even if you fall for it and you plug in your YubiKey and try to authenticate, that is not gonna work, simply because uh, YubiKeys and FIDO2 authenticators are registered to a specific website. So uh, you have one more thing to in favor of passwordless. Uh, no more password resets. On the next slide, I'm gonna talk about how much money we're losing every day as an industry just by spending time doing password resets. And of course, we, you don't have any more uh, dictionary attacks, credential stuffing, you know, password brute force, nothing. This is what I was talking about. This, oh, sorry. This slide is coming directly from the FIDO Alliance website. Uh, and the important thing that I wanted to mention is the average cost of a password reset is $70. So if you have a company that has 10,000 employees and you do a password reset just for one of them, uh, can you imagine how much money you are wasting just on password resets every year? Uh, I couldn't believe it the first time that I heard it, but I mean, uh, it is a very significant cost. If you do this uh, just uh, a thousand times a year, you're losing $70,000 just on password resets. That is unbelievable. All right, uh, so let's, Go back to the topic, uh, if passwords could be worse than um, passwords. Uh, I heard some misconceptions about passwords that I'd like to address. Um, some people think biometrics are less secure than, than passwords. Because when you say the word password, a lot of people think that since you are removing the password, you are making the account less secure. And as we have seen, that is not the case because we are replacing it with public key cryptography, which is much more stronger. Uh, also, I also have heard that people think that the phone could be unlocked using a photo or even a twin, uh, which usually doesn't happen. And also, uh, fingerprints uh, usually cannot be cloned, but even if they can be cloned, uh, the phone is going to realize that it's not the real fingerprint, it's, it's not going to work. So those misconceptions are really, really not true. Uh, what may be a little bit true is the stolen or lost, lost device uh, case. Uh, but Think about it, I mean, if somebody, if a threat actor is able to basically bypass the authentication of your phone, if they can bypass biometrics, I think you have uh, bigger things to worry about. So uh, that really is usually not a valid concern for, for most users. And lastly, uh, if they lose their phone, are they gonna lose their authentication? Well, that is also not true because usually we have to provide a, a different way to uh, authenticate users or gain access back to their account. So, uh, funny story, uh, the evil twin attack. Um, I, we actually have a coworker who has a twin, and um, he, my coworker, is not able to unlock his brother's phone with uh, Face ID. But his brother is actually able to unlock my coworker's phone. So, uh, we, I'd say that's a 50% success rate for account takeover. Uh, 
And for those specific cases where that is actually true, uh, obviously the recommendation would be to not use face ID. You can use, you know, any other form of biometrics. But I mean, uh, I'm not even kidding. That's, that's a risk that we're tracking in the company. Uh, her, her, his brother being able to unlock his account, but uh, yeah. All right, so let's, finally, uh, we had to go through all of that because I wanted to all of you to be on the same page about what passwordless is and what the risks are. So now we're gonna be talking about real vulnerabilities in a passwordless implementation. So item number one, I didn't include the title on purpose because if I did, uh, I would have given away the, the issue right away. So let's, let's dig in a, a little bit. So the first issue, uh, this screenshot is coming directly from the FIDO Alliance, well, the web authent uh, documentation. And it mentions that in order to add a device or in order to register an account, you have to provide an ID a uh, name and a display name. This is in the specification. This is needed. Uh, you have to provide them. It is required. So uh, I went and looked for some examples. Uh, this is from the Duo Security uh, website. So basically, they are saying that when you are registering a credential, you have to provide an ID, a name, and a display name. This is perfect. I mean, this is what the, 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 what the specification says, right? This is expected. Uh, one more example, uh, again, if you take a closer look, you're gonna realize that they are doing exactly the same. They are sending an, an ID, a name, and a display name. Uh, because again, this is expected. This is what the documentation says. One more example, uh, this is from Ubico. If you wanna add a security key to your web application, you have to do exactly the same. Because uh, FIDO2, well, security keys are also a FIDO2 credential. So you have to provide a name, a display name, and an ID. Lastly, for pass keys, you have to do exactly the same because pass keys are also a FIDO2 credential. So you have to provide a, an ID, a name, and a display name. That's, that's perfectly clear now, right? So let's now talk about a real implementation. Uh, not sure if you can see it in the back, but uh, in the, uh, this is an HTTP request. Uh, this is a web application that is sending a request to add a new device for a user. And uh, in the request body, you can see that the application is sending uh, two parameters, uh, the username and the display name. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, that is actually just my email address. Uh, forgot to ask, do we have any pen testers today with us? Can you raise your hand if you have? Okay. So uh, one common attack when you're doing pen tests is parameter tampering. Essentially, if you see a value, you change it to something different and see what happens. Since this is a email address for a username, one common uh, attack is trying to change that value to something different and see what happens. So what we did here was actually removing that value and change it to a different value. In this case, the big team that we wanted to uh, try to impersonate. And to our surprise, that actually worked. And uh, what happened there was that instead of adding one authenticator to our account, we were adding the authenticator to a different account. Uh, remember that this is passwordless. So we were adding a valid authenticator to somebody else's account. What this means is that with now, with this attack, we are able to impersonate any account that we want in the entire company. Uh, and uh, think about the CEO. Now we can add an, uh, an authenticator to the CEO's account and we can log it on the CEO just by doing this. Uh, this actually has a CVE. Uh, of course, this has been fixed. Uh, but let's, let's, let's talk about it more. So this application was really following the specification to the letter. They were doing everything right. Uh, there was nothing missing from the specification. Everything was done right. However, the specification doesn't mention that you don't have to trust this data. Uh, this may be obvious to security people, but this is not obvious to everyone. Uh, so that makes me think how many applications are out there that are following the specification to the letter, but they are not doing any additional checks because the documentation doesn't say that you have to do it, right? And one thing that happened since uh, a few months ago is that I actually raised this question to the FIDO Alliance. I did ask them, hey, where, am I just stupid? I, didn't, I was not able to find the documentation or are, is this hidden somewhere or wh where is it? And I didn't get any feedback. So to this day, I don't know if simply uh, the documentation is not there 
or is just expected to the developers to figure it out on their own? All right, so moving on to issue number two, magic links. Uh, one quick reminder, uh, web applications are very flexible and you can accomplish anything with web applications. Uh, as opposed to, let's say, mainframe applications that you cannot do a lot of things because they are very structured. And that is not the case with web applications. With web applications, you can do anything that you want. And uh, this is why we have magic links. This is a very clever way to authenticate users. So this is an example from a real application. Uh, of course, it's a little bit changed, but I mean, they had a very secure token and they had a link to authenticate users. However, they also had a different way to authenticate administrators, also using a magic link. What happened here was that uh, you could actually reuse the token for the regular user to become an admin by simply adding the word admin. So what, what, what happened there was that uh, they were not checking that the token was belonging to a user instead of an admin. And of course, this also has a CVE. And uh, let's, let's talk about it more. Uh, this magic link was, for the most part, very secure. The token was, uh, was created using uh, good cryptography. Uh, it had good length. It was using secure functions. Uh, the token actually uh, couldn't be reused. And even if you didn't use it, the token uh, expired after some time. So the magic link was doing everything correct. I mean, it was following all the industry standards. It was doing everything right. However, uh, as developers, we have to make sure that we are making, we are securing every single endpoint. We are providing authentication in every single endpoint. And as attackers, we just have to find one single thing that we missed. And that's what happened here. We just missed one thing. Uh, moving on to item number three, uh, account parameter, account takeover via parameter tampering. So again, uh, web applications are very, very flexible. Uh, for this item, I cannot provide a really detailed example, but essentially I can talk about it. So uh, this was an attack by an internal user. Essentially, they were authenticated to the application. They were providing a valid authentication for, for the user. But at some point of the request, they were able to tamper with a specific request and they were able to change something to authenticate as a different user. So they were providing a valid authenticator for their user, but they were actually authenticated as a different user, which of course is not ideal. Uh, moving on to number next item, we have the account creation flow. Again, web applications are very flexible. Um, this was an issue identified in a demo application. So basically, uh, we, we had a demo application where users can create accounts, they can log in, they can see how passwordless work. However, this particular application was not doing the proper checks to making sure that the user already existed. So let's say that you, you reach the login page and you say, hey, I want to create an account for the CEO. And the application was not making sure that the CEO account didn't exist. And then they let you create an account, uh, well, to add an authenticator to the CEO's account. So uh, again, this is a demo application, but it still uh, represents the risk of implementing passwordless uh, not in the right way. And uh, lastly, let's not forget about the OWASP top 10. Uh, you have to remember that all of these applications are still web applications. So simply because you're using passwordless, that doesn't mean that you don't have to worry about all the other attacks. So you still have to worry about cross scripting, cross repository, all of those good things. And especially authentication issues uh, and authorization issues. So even though the authentication part is done via passwordless and is more secure, uh, you have to remember that there are a lot of other things that we have to consider when, when implementing web applications. All right, so now some recommendations. So for developers, uh, I also forgot to ask, do we have developers in the house today? <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, cool, let's, let's give you some recommendations. Uh, secure SDLC. If your company has a secure SDLC, uh, I think it's very good that you follow it because it's going to allow you to prevent a lot of these issues early on. Uh, as we know, it's very expensive to identify security issues once we are in production. So the sooner we identify these things, the better. And then uh, it's recommended that you do some testing and testing by humans, security testing by humans, because all of these things that we talk about, there is no way that automated tools are going to find them. Uh, these things have to be found by humans because uh, tools don't have the context. 
And then, uh, of course, do more testing. And then more testing. Uh, again, uh, automated tools are not good at doing these things. Uh, these things have to be tested and found by humans. Also, one thing very important, uh, I would recommend you to actually embrace the testing for customers. A lot of companies don't like their customers doing pen tests on their products because uh, they don't want to find issues. And if they find issues, you have to fix them and you know, it is a whole thing. I actually recommend embracing it. Uh, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you, you're getting a free pen test, right? And you are learning about things that you have to fix. Somebody's gonna find them. Uh, of course, it's best if you find these things internally, but if you're not able to do that and a customer does, uh, that is way better than a threat actor finding those issues. For enterprises, if you're considering implementing passwordless, uh, you have two options, of course. You have the option of implementing it yourself or going to a vendor. If you're choosing a vendor, uh, I would recommend that you hold them accountable. And what I mean by this is that you ask them if, you, if they are really doing security testing. Uh, a lot of companies don't even have a security program in place, much less uh, they don't have any transparency. So uh, I think it would be good for companies to be more transparent. So for those companies that I mentioned that I didn't find any issues, so is it that they are not doing any testing or they are not talking about it? So yeah. And for pen testers, uh, don't be intimidated by passwordless. The first time that I saw this, I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to be able to find any issues. I mean, this is a public key cryptography implementation. I'm, there is no way that I'm going to be able to break this. And the truth is that you don't have to. I mean, uh, all the issues that we talk about, they are not related to the cryptography. So if you're a pen tester and you're thinking about doing some testing, uh, I would suggest you going for the authentication and authorization issues uh, and authenticated APIs. And again, all of these was found in web applications. And for users, uh, I know that I said a lot of things about passwordless, but actually passwordless is way more secure. So if you're offered with the option to use passwordless, go for it. Uh, it's gonna be more convenient. Uh, you're not gonna forget your passwords and it's gonna be faster. And that's it. Uh, I went really fast. Uh, we have a lot of time for questions uh, and thank you for being here today. Are there any questions? All right. Huh? All right. <laughs> oh, we have one? Sure. So the question was uh, if the ID and the username are not to be trusted. Uh, that is correct. So what happened here was that the, those values were being sent from the client. So you have to either making sure that those values are what you were expecting on the server. So again, yeah, making sure that those were the expected values. Correct. Or get them from the server. Sure, I'll make them available afterwards, the slides, yes. Uh, I didn't include a Twitter. Uh, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Uh, here's my email. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, please remember to add all the reds in the back. Uh, <laughs> and thank you. <laughs>